So this morning is the kickoff for Advent season, and our youth coordinator, Raven, is going to kick us off. You ready? Here we go. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Um, so today we enter into the season of Advent, and this is the time where we enter into reflection and reflection with joy as we anticipate and the remembrance of the coming of our Savior and his second coming. I used to do this growing up as a little girl, and then when I got to call it, it kind of just faded away. So this has been a joy to enter in this time again and remember what it means to reflect on the coming of our Savior. I have the privilege of lighting our first candle, which is the promise of the incarnation. So we're going to go ahead and read the scripture that that is on. It says, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Amen. Much like the Israelites, they were in a time of darkness and oppression. They were living in a sinful and broken world. And I really started to think about what was it like to be an Israelite in that time and how much of what they went through is what we're going through right now. A living in a dark and broken world of having this hope that continues to get crushed and crushed and crushed again by all these different systems that we put our hope in. And this desire to be made renewed, this desire to see not only humanity be restored, but all of creation. And it made me look at this verse much differently when I started to reflect on that. Starting at the beginning with Isaiah 9-6, it says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. This is just the continued declaration of God's love for us that he gave his son. I don't have a child yet, but I can't picture myself giving my child away to anyone. I flinch when my nieces cry. I could never do this, but the Lord gave his son to us. And he didn't give his son, and his son didn't come for us to worship him. His son didn't come to sit on man-made thrones. The son didn't come to be a ruler of man-made things. He came to serve us. He came to save us. He came to restore us. And not only humanity, but all creation. And just sitting on that, I said, wow. <laughs> Right there, I was already filled with joy. I don't know if you're filled with joy just on that part, but we all keep going. It says, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I'm a therapist, and in graduate school, they teach you all these different techniques to build a relationship with the client, to get the client to trust you so they can start sharing, be more vulnerable. And they teach us this thing about burnout. And burnout is this fatigue. It's this emotional, physical, spiritual fatigue that you get from serving other people day after day after day. And what happens with burnout is that you start to lose empathy. You start to lose hope that you can help that client, that you can see that client get into a better place. And you stop putting in that effort. You stop believing in that client and you stop believing in yourself. And I think about the words wonderful counselor and to know God doesn't deal with that at all. He is a wonderful counselor that he knows us. The scripture says he knows what words we're going to say before they come out of our mouth. He knows us. He didn't need the two years of schooling that I need and still have to do for the rest of my life. He has it. He embodies it all. And he doesn't ever lose empathy for us. He never loses patience for us, that he time and time again wants to walk with us, wants to validate us, wants to love on us with unconditional positive regard. He wants to show us <laughs> his deep, his deep, deep love. I could never be that kind of counselor, but I am so glad to have a relationship with one. It goes on to say his government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his answer, David, for all eternity. I think about all these different worldly 
systems and policies and governors and presidents that I've put my hope in. I put my hope in these different policies, but how they failed me time and time again. How people have been filled with corruption and leading them not to do the just thing, not to do the fair thing and to do what pleases them. And I think about the president on inauguration day and you see that picture of him. And then you see the picture 100 days in office and just that stress, that burden of carrying this country on their shoulders and you can see it in their face. You don't even get a whole picture of their body but their face shows, they're burnt, (laughs) they're exhausted. And to know we serve a God, to know we serve a king named Jesus who rules with justice and fairness, who it's nothing for him. It is nothing. When we think about it being on our shoulders, I just think about the pain and and walking crunch back, but it's nothing to him. (laughs) It's not even a feather to him. It's nothing. And I think about, man, (laughs) what would it be like if I shifted my hope? not in these worldly systems, not in these worldly policies, not in these worldly rulers and authorities, but on God. And put my hope and trust in that. How much more will that make this life on here more fulfilling? How would that lead me to respond to different situations? How would it lead me not being consumed every time that people don't get justice, every time that the system continues to fail and it overwhelms me, it fills me with deep, deep sorrow. And sometimes it's, I'm there for days. I'm there for days and God has to remind me, I'm your hope. I am your justice. I am the fairness. You may not experience it here on this earth, but I'm coming to bring it. And just that joy that it brings me. It goes on to say, the passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. I am so glad that he will make this happen. And I hope just sitting on that scripture that you can find some hope. Just this promise of the coming birth of our Jesus will just fill you with hope to not feel so weighed down by these things of this earth, but to know (laughs) that Jesus' birth meant an end to all of this, that he was coming to restore us in all of creation. And I hope that that makes you think about it. As it made me think, I said, how do I respond to the wonderful counselor? How do I respond to the Prince of Peace? How do I respond to the everlasting Father? Because then in many ways, I find myself not responding. In many ways, I find time and time again that I forget that he exists and that he offers that to me. And I turn to these earthly things that are broken and can't fulfill me in those ways. But man, what would it look like if we responded to the wonderful counselor, to the prince of peace, to the mighty God? And what would that look like when we respond to that and we were let that response fill us with light and joy that can be shared with others who are living in darkness like us? Hope that scripture brings you some encouragement in this time as we enter in a season of reflection and remembrance, but most of all of joy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your promise of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. We thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son and you sent your son with a purpose, Lord, to save and restore us to save and restore all of humanity and all of creation, Lord. May you just renew our hope. May we see things in a new light, Lord. Would you remove the scales from our eyes, Lord, and the wax from our ears, Father. We thank you that you never fail us on any of your promises, and we thank you for one of the best promises you gave us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all. Uh, We're just going to get set up here a little bit. Um, So we appreciate your patience with us as we uh, get set up this morning. Uh, I know that we all come to our Sunday morning experience with certain expectations for what Sunday is going to look like. And a lot of that probably has to do with our particular cultural expression that we grew up with in church. And at Epiphany, we've been shaking that up just a little bit, uh, especially over the last month. 
And so we appreciate um, your patience with us and your flexibility to go along on this adventure with us. We believe that uh, there's some specific strategic reasons for us to do things a little bit differently. We believe it's biblical, and we also uh, believe that the Holy Spirit is leading us um, into some of these kind of new ways of experiencing the Word of God together. So this morning, we're going to do things a little bit differently. We've been in a series on the book of Joseph. Some of you might remember that. Um, Over the last month, things have gotten shaken up due to external things that have happened, um, as well as just some seasonal things that have happened. So uh, we're taking a bit of a break, but in that series, we have been meeting in groups in the context of Sunday morning. And this will be our third time doing that within the context of Sunday morning, our last time doing that together. And so we hope that it's been fruitful, encouraging for you. Um, We have a very gifted preacher for a lead pastor, and we appreciate those times that we get to hear from him. We also, and at the same time, you, the people of God, are an incredible resource for each other. And so on Sunday mornings, we want you to be able to experience that as well. So today, um, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Mike. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a part of the lead team at Epiphany. So myself and my sister Paulita are going to open up the Word of God with you this morning. And so uh, we want to give a special welcome to those of you who are online. Uh, It's going to be difficult to gather in groups for you, but if you want to take this time within your family... Uh, to discuss the questions that we're going to discuss, or if you want to just take the time to journal, um, you know, write down and reflect on some of the things that we're talking about, that would be great. Special hello to Pastor Kevin, who we know is, is watching because he's texting us and asking us, okay, what's happening now? What's going to go next? So um, we got it, Pastor Kevin. So we hope that you are healing well, recovering well, And um, so a special hello to you and my family. My wife and my kids are at home, so hello to you as well. Um, And the rest of you who are worshiping with us online today, we we welcome you guys as well. So um, as we get into the word together, I am going to pray for us, and then we'll uh, we'll kind of dive in. We have these stools here. I don't... Okay. Um, I'm going to pray for us. Lord, we invite you this morning by your Spirit to open up your word to us. Uh, Lord, we know that historically there have been times where people have used your word as a sword to cut each other down, but we pray this morning that you would use it like a surgeon to uh, bring about healing, to bring about transformation, to um, cut to the division of of joint and marrow, and to, uh, to bring about change in our hearts. So we invite you this morning, bless this time, bless this time as we gather in groups. We pray that you would use it to encourage, to challenge, to bless. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I get a little bit antsy, so I feel like I have to move around. I might sit down some uh, as well. But Okay, we are going to look at a passage of Scripture. Raven did a great job, and this is absolutely the work of the Holy Spirit um, that God would have put this passage on her heart because we didn't coordinate this, but uh, we're going to be looking at... She talked about Isaiah... I know we didn't put the the passage on the screen. She talked about Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, and we're going to be diving into actually the first part of that passage in chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. So I'm going to go ahead and read that. You can um, read along on the screen. It says this, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice 
when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. And then it goes on in the next verse to talk about, for unto you a child is born. And the passage that Raven shared with us earlier. In verse 2, it says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those ten words probably sum up the season of Advent as well as any passage that you see anywhere throughout Scripture. This is a time of anticipation. It's a time of expectant waiting, of, of expectant waiting like Raven shared with us earlier, a chance to celebrate God taking on flesh and coming as a child. And at the same time, we're anticipating his coming again. And so this idea of darkness and light, that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, really paints a great picture of what Advent is about. And part of that is understanding the darkness around us, the darkness that we experience. Uh, we heard a little bit about that already, uh, but for the people of Israel at the time that this was written, they had experienced some significant drama and trauma. Um, this this happens about 800 years after where we were in the book of or in the book of Exodus, talking about Joseph, and the people have been enslaved in Egypt. They've been delivered. They asked God for a human king, and those human kings then, one after another, began to turn from God along with the people. And the people of Israel then experienced these other kingdoms coming in and um, taking over. These other kingdoms coming in and conquering and ruling over them. And so this prophecy, that what's ha- what we're reading about in Isaiah, is happening right at the beginning of these other kingdoms coming in and conquering them. So for the people of Israel, this is a time of crisis. It's absolutely a time of crisis. And I wonder if any of us have experienced any crisis recently. I could probably give a long list, and I'm sure you don't need me to remind you of the things that we have experienced over the last couple of years. Uh, We've all experienced some darkness over the In recent times, we've experienced darkness. But the interesting thing, as I studied this passage in Isaiah, looking at chapter 9, is that the external circumstances, the crisis that they were experiencing, was only just a part of the darkness that they were walking in at the time. So if you look at the beginning of the chapter that we just read, it starts with the word nevertheless, which means something must have come before, right? Right? Nevertheless, and then it goes on to, to talk about the things that we, we just read earlier. In the Hebrew Bible, that passage, that, that first, cha- that first uh, verse of chapter 9 is actually a part of chapter 8. So we know that what happens in chapter 9 is connected to what happens before. And this is important when we look at Scripture to understand the full picture. So... What happens in chapter 8, I'm just going to read a little bit of the end of chapter 8 and listen to this and, uh, and think about what the people are experiencing. It says, When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged, and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. So the people of Israel during this time, they were in crisis. And where did they go for answers? They went to the mystics. They went to the earth. They went to uh, human resources, scholars, the kings of the day. They were looking for light. 
wherever they could find it, right? And it led them into utter darkness. That's what it says at the end of that chapter. So they're walking in utter darkness. And it's easy to give the people of Israel a hard time. Why, don't they, why do they keep doing this? They turn from God, and then they get punished, and then they do it again and again and again, um, despite all the things that they have experienced. But as I read this passage, I had to ask myself the question, when I experience a time of crisis, where is the first place that I turn? When I experience a time of crisis, where's the first place that I turn? Do I go to my favorite news resource or blog? Do I go straight to social media? Do I talk to a friend who always has the answers? Do I find some form of self-care? Is that my first response? Do I find a way to distract myself from all the things that are happening in this crisis around me? And it's not that these things are bad. It's not that all these things are all bad in and of themselves. But where on the list for me is turning to prayer? Where on the list for me is turning to God and, and looking to his word for answers in the midst of that, in the midst of crisis? That's a challenging question for me. We see darkness in the world around us as large and small crises hit us every day. And we see darkness inside ourselves as we, like the Israelites, turn anywhere but God for answers. So where's the light in the midst of all of this darkness? Isaiah promises in chapter 9, the, the passage that we just read, that there is a light coming that will shatter the yoke that burdens them. And Raven painted a great picture of what that looks like as she talked about this idea of a child being born, that he would be a wonderful counselor, he'd be the prince of peace, he'd be mighty God, and that he would transform the world. Also in Matthew 4, when it talks about Jesus coming out of the wilderness and starting his ministry of preaching, it actually quotes this passage, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. It's connected to who Jesus is, to his ministry, to who he is to us. And then later in the New Testament, I think for me, we see an even greater picture of what this means to be walking in darkness and to see a great light. We're introduced to this character of Saul, who by the worldly standards has achieved much. Even religiously, he's, he's at the top of the list. He's achieved a lot. And he's walking along this road, but he's walking in darkness because he doesn't know Jesus. He's depending on his own wisdom, on worldly sort of um, answers, even though he's not necessarily in a time of crisis. He's walking in darkness. And he encounters a great light along the road to Damascus that actually blinds him. And it transforms and turns his entire world upside down. And this man, this man who was walking in darkness, who saw a great light, ends up and goes on to be used by God in powerful and significant ways. And so as I think about Advent, as I think about lighting the candle, as I think about the light and darkness, as I think about driving around and I see Christmas lights everywhere that I go, I think about this idea that those of us who walk in darkness have seen a great light. And like Saul, who would later become Paul, we have the opportunity to be transformed by this great light that we experience. And so that's my hope for us. That's my hope for you guys as we think about this, this idea of these 10 words that are really one of the most significant principles during the season of Advent. The people, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And I pray that Jesus would be that great light for you guys as you walk throughout this season. So we're gonna take a couple of minutes to have some discussion time in your groups. I have two questions for you guys that deal kind of with this passage from Isaiah chapter 9. 
and you'll see them up here on the screen. So the, the first question is, um, and this might have to do with external circumstances that you've experienced. It might have to do with maybe ways that you have turned elsewhere besides God for, for answers to in the midst of crisis. So it may take some vulnerability um, as much as you're willing to share. What are some ways that this past year has felt particularly dark for you? That's the first question. So introduce yourself in your groups. Um, go around and take, take turns um, answering that first question. And then after you're done with that, the second question is, what do you think it looks like for Jesus to be light for you in your particular circumstances? Or what does it look like for Jesus to be light for you during this season? And so we'll keep you on track. We'll let you know, uh, make sure that you're moving along. Um, but go ahead and introduce yourselves and then start answering these questions in your group. Okay, hopefully you are wrapping up your responses to the last questions. This is that teacher warning. If you hear my voice, clap once. Oh, there it is. If you hear my voice, clap twice. If you hear my voice, clap three times. I'm just playing. <laughs> Okay, well, hopefully you had a great exchange with folks in your group and you got a chance to talk a little bit about, you know, what it means to be looking and anticipating Christ, the light of Christ in your life, especially during this Advent season. Um, and I, I trust that you're edifying, edifying each other and uh, gleaning some wonderful um, insight into how God works not only in your life, but how He's working in all of our lives. That is always such a great time of reflection. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, propose another set of scripture to you. And this one, uh, we're going to concentrate on John, first chapter, verses 9 through 14. And it'll be on your screen. So I'm going to read it and you just follow along with me. And let's see what the Lord is saying uh, through his word. Verse 9 says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, not of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of one, the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. So as we look at this uh, portion of scripture, I love when it says the true light has come into the world. And that really just goes with what, um, what has been shared by Raven and what has been shared by Mike as well, that we have the privilege of, of being a part of a story where God decided to bring the true light into the world and illuminate our lives. So just as there was anticipation of this coming light, when the light did come, it came in a package that no one recognized. It came in a way that people didn't expect him to come. They were waiting maybe for a religious leader. They were waiting for maybe an ethnic light or a political redeemer. But in fact, God chose not to send any of those. He chose to send a light that they didn't recognize. We think about a political leader or a um, religious leader or an ethnic leader, those maybe might, we could liken them to like flashlights. You know, a flashlight is only as good as the battery you put in it, right? If you have no battery, what's going to happen with that light? Okay, that, wait a minute. Y'all got to talk back to me because this, I know you're looking at me and, and you're like, what is she going to talk about? But it's okay. I want you with me, thinking with me, processing with me, right? So if you have a flashlight, but it has no batteries, is that going to be an effective light? Absolutely not, right? It's not going to work at all. Well, God, in fact, chose, I love this analogy, God didn't send a flashlight. 
he decided to send a torch light, a torch light. Matter of fact, in um, Malachi, it talks, Malachi uh, verse, or chapter three, verse two, God likens Christ as a fire, a refining fire, right? Who can stand against a refining fire? That's who Christ is. He's that refining fire for our, for our lives. And instead of that flashlight, we have a torch. And the torch was sent, not only just to lighten up, light up the world, but really to refine our lives, refine the things that, that fall short, refine the things about us that need to fall away so that we can be in the presence of God. Amen? And so God sent a different kind of light. Jesus, he was uh, an otherly kind of light, a light out of this world, from another world. And so I want us to, to think about this. Have you ever experienced a time in your life when you had an idea of what God was doing or you had an idea of what God should do? Huh? And then God did something totally different, right? You thought maybe he should show up as a flashlight, but he decided, nope, we're going to burn some things. It's going to be a torchlight. Amen? And so I want you to think about that. Have you ever uh, experienced a time when God, you thought you had an idea of what God was, should do, but in fact, he chose to do something different. He had an otherly agenda, okay? And so I want you to ponder this question in your groups. Share a time in your life when God's plan proved to be otherworldly compared to yours. Share a time in your life when God's plan proved to be otherworldly. In other words, he didn't do things the way the world, the way the world does, the way we would have him do, but he had a whole new revelation, a whole new plan for you. Go ahead and share in your groups. And, and I, I think actually I want to share just an example. Uh, I remember when I was um, uh, working for a, a summer job, working at, for a church, it happened to be a covenant church, but at the time I didn't know that. And um, this is a time when God actually turned some things around and in fact created an opportunity for me that I wasn't looking for, I didn't really want, I didn't think I needed. Uh, the Lord had this pastor forward my resume to another school that I had never heard about. And my plan was to continue working at, at um, St. Paul schools, ministering to the children there. But God had an otherly, worldly plan, an otherworldly plan. Uh, and eventually, long story short, getting a job at Minnehaha and then coming into the covenant church was a whole nother thing that I just was not prepared for. But God knew that that's what he wanted to do. And it just was something I could never even think of. I could never even prepare for. And out of that, uh, be, saying yes and being obedient, God actually rekindled in my heart uh, the desire to serve him and to minister to his people. So that's an example of how God can just take something and you think your plan is perfect. And God could just take it and, and totally scrap it and give you his plan, right? Because his plan is otherworldly and more beneficial for you. So in your groups, share a time, perhaps when that has happened to you, where uh, you thought you had everything under control and you thought the plans that you had created were, were the right plans, but God decided to show you, of his, show you about his otherworldly plan, okay? And you get four minutes to do that. Oh, 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 I heard groaning. Okay. Uh, we're going to give you six. Four and a half. Six. Amen. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'm not even going to look to my left over here because I know they're going to ask for more time. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have come to the end of that discussion segment. The good news is that you are going to go right back into it. So... If you can just pause your discussion for a second. Um, and I want to acknowledge again the people at home. Thank you for sticking with us. Hopefully you're having good discussion at home. Um, I also got a message from Pastor Kevin. We get messages while we're up here. That he is not recovering right now. He is fully recovered. So praise the Lord. He's fully recovered. He is with family in Milwaukee uh, joining us in, serv in the service from there. So I uh, wanted to get that message. Was there anything else I need to say? Eating too much, Paulita said, for Thanksgiving. So he might be out again next week. We'll see. 
Um, okay. We are going to now, for the next few minutes, um, give you an opportunity to discuss just a little bit more and then to have some time of prayer within your groups. So the way that this is going to work is um, we have one more question, and it, it's kind of connected to all the things that we've already talked about, uh, this idea of Jesus showing up as the light and the different ways we've talked about him being the light for us. Um, and so the question is this, in what way do you hope to experience Jesus as the light during this Advent season? It might be connected to something you've already shared, but what we would like for you to do is to go around in the, the circle in your group and just share one way that you would like to experience Jesus as the light during this season, and then listen very carefully, because after we do that, <clears throat> you'll have an opportunity to pray for the person on your left. Does everybody know their left? Okay, you'll pray for the person on your left. And so, very briefly, so go around and share, and then take maybe 30 seconds to a minute just to pray for that person on your left. And then we'll come back together after that to close out. The question is, in what way do you hope to experience Jesus as the light during this Advent season? Go. Did you cut me off? Go ahead and discuss and pray. Okay, we're going to bring you back. Bring you back. In. And if you need more time after service to pray, certainly feel free to stay in your groups and to continue to pray for each other. But we're going to wrap up our time together and focus on the 12th verse of John, um, John 1 that says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in him, um, for those, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And that's who we are. We are the children of God. It says children born not from a natural descent, nor from a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. That's us, you guys. We are born of God. And we have to remember that uh, we have hope, because, not because of anything that we have done or of anything that we have earned, okay? We have hope because we are God's children through Christ. We're no longer outsiders. For those of you who have been, ex for those of us who have accepted and believed on Jesus' name, we have been given the right and the authority to be grafted into God's body. Amen? God's family. It, uh, amen? All right, y'all. That's good news. And in this Advent season, we want to remember those, those very words that, you know, in a season especially sometimes the holiday season can be depressing for some uh, because of whatever circumstances they're, they're dealing with. Uh, we don't have to be that group of people. We can actually bring hope to those who don't have anything else to hope in. And so I want to wrap up our time in prayer. And uh, I just ask that you bow your heads. And I'm going to pray over us as we begin this Advent season. Most Heavenly Father, we come bowing our hearts to you with thanksgiving. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. And we thank you, Lord, that your love extends toward us. The scriptures tell us that you loved us so much that you gave your one and only son that whosoever believes in him, they would have everlasting life. And we are grateful for his sacrifice. Father God, we thank you for the light of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the light he brings into this world, into our world. Show us, Lord, how to see him moving. Help us, Lord, to flow with how he is moving. Father, we thank you that your word became flesh and dwells among us. We have seen and will see his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came 
from the Father, full of grace and truth. Father God, we put our hope in you, not because of anything we have done or earned. We hope in you, Lord, because you have grafted us into your family. We are your children because we receive your son. We believe that he is the light of the world who chases away the darkness. And we enter into this season of anticipation and the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Help us to trust in you and your plan. Just as you proclaimed in the beginning, let there be light. We trust that you will light up the darkness of this world. We trust that you will light up the darkness of our world. And so we say, come Lord Jesus. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of our heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen and amen. Well, thank you all for participating in our time of reflection and our time of prep preparing or preparation for the Advent, Advent season. Like I said, if you didn't get a chance to finish praying for one another, please use this time to continue to pray and uh, encourage one another. Uh, and we just want you to have a blessed rest of your weekend. And I want to encourage you, like Julia mentioned, on the Church Center app, we'll be uh, putting our Advent devotionals onto the app so that you can reflect on those throughout the week and encourage one each other in your household to keep your eyes on Jesus, our coming Savior. Amen? And next week, we look forward to being uh, back with our pastor, Kevin. He'll be back, and uh, he's excited to get us back into our study of Joseph. Are you guys excited about Joseph? Amen. Well, go and uh, have a blessed day. Thank you.